The child whose parents were arrested was checked for public danger, could he, like his relatives, harm the state? If this was confirmed, the child was sent to a camp, a correctional labor colony or a special regime orphanage. In the late 30s, the Soviet Union began a period of great terror, mass repressions against its own citizens, many of whom were branded enemies of the people and their loved ones, family members of traitors to the motherland. On the orders of People's Commissar Nikolai Yezov, the wives of convicts were sent to camps, and children were sent to special regime orphanages throughout the country, where they were shamed by educators, bullied and beaten by other pupils, and doctors sometimes refused to provide emergency assistance. Moreover, the brothers and sisters were specifically separated to re-education. In this video, I will tell the story of the Gulag through the eyes of people whose fathers and mothers were recognized as enemies of the people. How did the Great Terror create a new category of criminals and whom did the state classify as socially dangerous children? How did the heroes remember the day of their parents' arrest? What was life like in orphanages and special settlements with exiled parents? Why did many relatives not want to take their children home? And how did the trials they went through change their lives? The history of state terror is millions of human lives, ground up by mass repressions, under which anyone could fall a simple worker, a military man, a member of the clergy, a party member. There is still no consensus on what caused the mass arrests and why, for dissent, a harmless joke, tries to move to another country, and much more, contrary to the ideology of the state, a person could be sent to a camp or shot, and his relatives branded as a family member a traitor to the motherland. Many years later, even children whose parents were arrested do not have a clear answer to the question, why? Yulia Pashayeva was born in 1936 to a large, friendly family. Mother Tatiana Andrianovna Sineta, father Mikhail Dmitrievich Sineta, and four siblings. When she was a year and a half old, people in uniform came for her father. The verdict was passed. Article 58 Treason to the Motherland, and the life of the Senate family changed. Mikhail Dmitrievich was shot. Tatiana Andrianovna, who did not want to recognize her husband as an enemy of the people, was sent to a camp, where she later died. Each of the children was assigned to different orphanages. Until the age of 16, Julia knew nothing about the fate of her siblings and her parents. One day the teacher secretly said, Julia, be careful, your parents are enemies of the people. If a person was arrested, everyone in his family received the status of a family member of a traitor to the motherland. Automatically, in the eyes of others, such people became traitors, which means outcasts and scum of society. Children of enemies of the people were attacked by peers and adults. In the orphanage, other pupils beat Yulia. The teachers were ashamed. From fear, hunger and cold, we urinated at night. One cruel teacher lined us up and shamed us in front of everyone. The guys were shouting and calling names. To keep the mattress dry, I went to bed, like many others, under the bed, recalls Julia. Esther Dasovskaya was born in 1939. Her father, Abram Abramovic Dasovsky, was a simple worker. They survived two world wars, and in 1950 they worked as the head of the planning department of the Gidramusomol Prom, until people in uniform came for them, like Yulia's father. The same article, 58. He was arrested on New Year's Eve, recalls Esther. I had a big box, and there were toys neatly in it. When I returned from the pioneer camp, everything was turned upside down. I do not know what they were looking for among the toys. Esther was a little more lucky. Unlike Julia, she did not end up in an orphanage, but at the same time, the girls' lives were no different from each other. Esther also had the status of a family member of a traitor to the motherland. She was also bullied by children and adults. The teacher went and told Esther's classmates, children, be careful, there are enemies of the people among us. Because of her status, Esther lost her gold medal, and once almost lost her life. When the doctors found out whose daughter she was, they refused to cut out her appendix. The attack began, we went to the hospital, but I was not hospitalized. They gave me a painkiller injection and sent me home. The pain went away, but after a week it started again. Then our driver took me to a local vet he knew, and he saved my life. The children of the enemies of the people were abandoned by relatives. Many were afraid to face harassment. 
Someone did not want to draw attention to themselves once again, because NKVD officers checked every potential guardian for compromising data. Of course, there were people who, despite their fears, wanted to take the child away, but they did not have such an opportunity. There have been cases where the child's last name was intentionally misspelled or intentionally changed. NKVD officers believed that the children of enemies of the people needed to be re-educated, and only the state could do this. After my father's arrest, an NKVD officer came to the apartment to take me to an orphanage. My aunt bought me out by giving me a family heirloom, a silver ring. Subsequently, I was secretly taken to the Krasnodar territory, where I lived for several years. It is unclear exactly how they wanted to re-educate the children. Usually, no one worked with them in orphanages. They were left to themselves. She was like a savage, she was carried away to the forest for berries, roots, to swim. She went far into the taiga, walked alone. She was brave, climbed trees, drowned, got sick and survived, says Yulia Pashieva. Someone ran away, became a street kid. In conditions of constant harassment and harassment, the absence of a loved one nearby, the child became aggressive, and, naturally, the number of crimes in the country increased. In the 20s, such a social phenomenon as theft became widespread. According to one version, the term, thieves-in-law, which exists in modern Russia, originates from there. The Great Terror has created a new category of criminals. In one of the paragraphs of the NKVD order, on the operation to repress the wives and children of traitors to the motherland, the term, socially dangerous children, appears for the first time. The child whose parents were arrested was checked for public danger, could he, like his relatives, harm the state? If this was confirmed, the child was sent to a camp, a correctional labor colony, or a special regime orphanage. The main purpose of special regime orphanages was to control children and eradicate dissent, so many were placed in orphanages so that no one close and familiar would be around. The state wanted to re-educate the children of enemies of the people. The resolutions of the NKVD stated that educational activities should be carried out in every correctional labor colony for minors. Educators were required to organize lectures, reports, talks, concerts for their wards, but in fact no one was engaged in children. Minors, like adults, were subjected to an endless number of interrogations before being sent to a correctional labor camp. It was not uncommon for children to end up in the same cell as adult criminals. An excerpt from the documentary book of memoirs by Yakub Akhmedovich Oktomov, Against the Blows of Fate, Petya was the only son of an engineer at the Baymak copper smelter, his mother was a teacher of Russian language and literature. Both are party members, the family was friendly, his mother was arrested first. Petya did not understand what it was. Two people came, called the neighbors, witnesses and began to look for something, turning everything upside down in the house. Petya only remembered that his mother was crying uncontrollably and kept repeating, it's not my fault, it's because of the portrait of Stalin. Everything happened by accident, people will confirm. The father was taken away in a black funnel, and the son returned to an empty looted apartment. At school, everyone shunned him, called him the son of an enemy of the people. They were excluded from the pioneers. All day and even at night he walked around the NKVD building, asking for permission to see his father or mother. One day a man came out of this house with a kind smile and took the boy with him. He was glad to see his parents, but they pushed him into a car, took him to prison and put him in a cell with criminals. At first they mistook him for one of their own and treated him well, but after learning that he was the son of an enemy of the people, they began to mock. Every Soviet schoolboy knew a photo of Stalin with a little girl in his arms. Her name was Gelia Markizheva, and she was the epitome of an era of happy childhood, which the state promised to provide for every child. Galina Alexeyevna Denisko often asked her father why they lived in the Amur region if the whole family was from Belarus. And in general, why does someone live in Moscow, and they are at the edge of the world? Who and where to live is decided in Moscow, he replied. Alexei Doroshkin, Galina's father, once had everything, a large family, land that the Doroshkins bought with their own money. Alexei's grandfather, Ivan Doroshkin, always dreamt of his own land. He put into the bank every ruble he had saved from his salary, and eventually bought land for himself. During the years of collectivization, the Doroshkin family did not join the collective farm, but remained sole proprietors. 
There were many of them, which allowed them to cultivate the land themselves and provide housing without using the labor of hired workers. The Doroshkins had a large, beautiful garden. Dad often told Gala about him. The garden was the epitome of coziness and comfort, which the Doroshkin family was deprived of in 1929. On this day, Alexei and his brother were returning from the cinema. We heard a noise in the house, we entered, and two NKVD officers were standing there, he recalls. The mother, kneeling in the middle of the room and holding her head in her hands, howled. They were given three hours to pack, sent into exile, as indicated in the documents, in the order of dispossession. That's how the Doroshkin family ended up in the Amur region. The special settlements were bare steps without a single building and no conditions for normal life. They were located in the most remote places of the Soviet Union. Many special settlements were located in swampy areas and were not suitable for the basic use of water. In winter, residents had to use melted snow, and in summer they had to take water from the swamps, which led to many infections. From Yagoda's memo about special settlers, 1931, the morbidity and mortality of special settlers are high. The monthly death rate is 1.3% of the population per month in northern Kazakhstan, 0.8% in the Narim region. There are especially many children of younger groups among the dead. Thus, up to 15% of children under the age of 3 die every month. People lived in barracks of 300, 500 people. They were fed two times a day, just so that no one would starve to death. From the memoirs of Alexei Doroshkin, typhus began in 1931, 32 years. The infirmary could not accommodate all the patients, so all the people fell ill and died right in the barracks along with the healthy ones. There were usually 10 to 40 patients in the barracks. There are 10.15 dead. When typhus came, up to 50 people died every day. Patients pretended to be healthy because such people were not given bread in hospitals. At the age of 13, the children started working with their parents. They carried logs by hand, built new barracks for visiting settlers. The day off was on Sunday, but this happened extremely rarely. Of course, hard work affects a person's physical condition. The women, who also worked at the sawmill and hauled heavy logs, suffered from seizures, epilepsy, and exhaustion. Children who were doomed to die were called, losers. That's what they said about Alexei, but he was, lucky. Dad was working on general jobs at a logging site and was completely exhausted. It is unknown how long he would have lasted. But one day, while working on loading timber, the stack rolled out, pinched and broke his leg in the knee. Dad was in the hospital for a long time. As a result, the leg remained alive, only it became 7 centimeters shorter than the healthy one. His crippled leg helped him stay alive, says his daughter Galina. And then what, after Stalin's death, the Khrushchev thaw began. In 1956, at the 20th Congress of the CPSU, the new party leader Nikita Khrushchev criticized Stalin's actions, there was a debunking of the cult of personality. In 1959, the gulag would cease to exist. A long process of rehabilitation of innocent people will begin. In 1953, within three months of the adoption of the amnesty decree, almost half of the people whose prison term was less than four years were released. Some of them are not angry at the state. On the contrary, they thank life for all the trials they had to go through. Someone still hates the government that once took away their most valuable things. To date, it has been documented that more than 4 million people have been arrested on political charges. Of this number, more than 1 million were shot. About 7 million people were forcibly evicted from their homes. Many of them, including children, died on the way to special settlements and on the spot. About 20,000 children ended up in orphanages. These are rough statistics. There are no official figures, because the number of victims is constantly growing with the discovery of new documents and archives. If a person forgets their story, they are doomed to relive it.